In the movie Breakthrough, we're going to talk today about uh, bringing what's dead back to life. In the movie, the whole main character was the, <clears throat> the young man who had died and him being brought back to life. But there was a, a subline in there that if you missed it, you didn't understand what was going on. The paramedic that actually found John was not a believer. He was an atheist. He had, they had said uh, his captain was there. And how many of you all have seen the movie? Just one? Okay, then I'm going to tell the rest of you. So, so you, can get, you can get it and, and watch it. The captain had told them you need to pull back. You need to come on out of the water. It's useless. We can't find him. They didn't hear him. What the man heard was a small voice whispering to him, turn around and try one more time. And he said, that was the voice of God speaking to me. But I don't believe in God. But yet what you'll find as you go to the end of the movie and you see the, see the movie, you'll find out that he became a believer Amen. because of that moment of time. So bringing life, bringing death, bringing life into something dead was more than just the little boy being brought back to life. It was also a paramedic who had spent his whole life not knowing God. Now, all of a sudden, understanding what life and people being brought back to life really meant. And it changed his whole, his whole career and everything else. And I'll try to keep this away as much as I can. So, during this whole series, I'll try my best. Problem is it rubs up against my whiskers, which means I guess I'm gonna to have to shave. <laughs> but this whole series has been about, what's your breakthrough? What is it that God's trying to do in your life? You see, because so many times, there's so many things that we don't think is possible. When uh, Sue was diagnosed with cancer, the outcome didn't seem very good. My brother was diagnosed with cancer three times. It didn't seem very good. This time when they came back and they told him that the cancer that you have, that's another reason why I can't hear, is my brother ran out the batteries too. I doubt if he's watching this, but I will get even with him. There we go. 
Let's try again. So anyway, part of the things that we don't realize is that the things that we're looking for, the breakthrough that we're looking for, God can do if we believe. It's pray big and believe big. Because so many times what we want to do is we, we just want to settle for the mediocrity. And I don't know about you all, but I am tired of settling for mediocrity. I want people to know that the God that I served is a lot bigger than they give him credit for. Amen. That he can do the things that sometimes uh, we look at doctors and we look at them as bringing things back to life. But let me say this to you. God is in, the, is in the process of bringing a lot of things back to life. And it could be in your life. For instance, maybe it's your marriage. Your marriage seems like it's just dead. It's not going anywhere. But you know what God can do? Bring it back to life. We sometimes think maybe you're in a dead-end job. And then all of a sudden, God opens up another job. And then all of a sudden you realize, you know what? God, thank you so much. Or it may be that you're in a relationship and your relationship is not going well. It seems like it's dead. But maybe God says, hold on a minute. Let me revive something here. Let me do it this my way. Or maybe you've been like others who have gone to a doctor and the doctor said, you've only got six months to live, and 26 years later, you're still living. Because they're only practicing medicine. God knows medicine. He's not practicing. He's been doing this for a lot longer than they have been. And let me tell you something. I think he knows how it fits together a little bit better than we do. There are so many things that are unknown that man does not know, but may I say to you, God does know. So let me say to you, if God can bring his son back to life, I think he can do that in your life too. And so many times we don't give him credit for that. So we've been looking in the last four weeks on how do I position myself so that God can perform a breakthrough in my life. And for those of you that haven't been here and, and didn't get a seat, uh, you can actually go back on Facebook and you can pick the sermons up. Uh, if you can't pick them up there, I think, do you still post them on YouTube? Yes. Okay, uh, you go to YouTube. Uh, we do have a channel called Calvary Baptist Middletown, okay, and you'll also find uh, the sermon posted there. So if you ever want to go back and visit and, and see those, uh, they're there. So th there's multitudes of ways that you can still get and see what we've been looking at. So let's go back. The storyline, a young boy by the name of John Smith who was 14 years of age. He fell into the ice, it was in the ice for over 15 minutes. They worked on him for 45 minutes trying to get him to come back to life, and they couldn't. And so when the doctors, when they looked at the, the, the paramedic, the one guy that was still working and working and working, they looked and they said, we've got to call it. We've got to stop. And they wanted to call the time of death. And they called it and they looked at the mother and she said, no. And they said, yeah, he's dead. Not my son. You see, she had, was pregnant with a, a child when she was young. And she gave that child up for an adoption. And she had asked God, God, would you give me another son? She wasn't able to have another son. And so she adopted John 15 years ago, 
before the incident happened. She was a Christian and she prayed, God, let the Holy Spirit just breathe life back into my son. And all of a sudden, the machine that was recording the heartbeat, which had flatlined, beep, 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 beep. And everybody in amazement of hearing little beep, 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 beep. No way can he be alive. Yes, he was. And then when he finally came back awake, was able to do things that nobody ever thought that he could do, she just said, Holy Spirit, bring my son back to life. And when you think about a few weeks ago as we were celebrating Easter, the story of a son being brought back to life. And that's what this is all about. That day when Jesus, when God brought his son Jesus back to life, ladies and gentlemen, what he was teaching us is this. He would be the first fruit of those who were dead and we are to follow because God is trying to bring our dead lives back to a fullness of life. No longer dying, but living. You may have the same body, the same makeup, you look the same, you dress the same, whatever. But there's a change that goes on on the inside that all of a sudden starts bubbling up to the outside. And God says that you'll know that you are alive because you become a new creature. You're not the same as you used to be. And he begins to tell us these things. I showed you the first clip. And so I want to show you the second clip this morning that we're going to talk about. And I know that you love John just as much as I do. Maybe more. I love John, and I know you do too. I don't know what you have in store for him, but I surrender. In order to get ready for your breakthrough, ladies and gentlemen, you gotta surrender. She said, I am a woman who is broken, but yet so full of pride. I gotta, re I gotta realize I need to turn loose. And that's the problem. There's so many things that we wanna hold on to. 
We want to grab hold of them. We want to keep it. And as long as we hold on to it, as long as we continue to hold it and keep it, ladies and gentlemen, we will never see a breakthrough that God wants to do in our life. Whenever we sit there and we say, God, I, I, I really, I can't turn them loose. Then he says, then you're not ready. And when she totally, totally surrendered, the impact that, that jo- her son John made was not just made that day in that town. The impact of her son John now has impacted this whole nation around the world. People that, are, that have seen this show, this movie, Breakthrough. They're realizing that there is a God that still performs miracles. Where doctors say, I can't do this. I've done everything that I can do. I can't. There's nothing else I can do. And they give up. And she said, okay. You just do what you can do, and let's let God do what he can do. And too many times what we want to do is we want to tell God what we want him to do. And it doesn't work that way. We need to let go. You see, when Jesus died, that wasn't the end, ladies and gentlemen. When Jesus died and was resurrected, ladies and gentlemen, that was a breakthrough. Nobody else had ever come back to life like Jesus. You see, Jesus has told us in Romans chapter 6 and verse number 23, he says that the wages of sin is death. Even though Jesus never committed a sin, he took the weight of your sin and my sin, and ladies and gentlemen, had to die. And he did. That day, Jesus took the penalty of death that belonged to us in a total separation from God. Jesus took it so that we would not have to. He paid the price so that you and I could have life. Because the rest of that verse says, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. No one else. He didn't say that he would give you eternal life through your good works, through your church attendance, through your ties, through your being nice to everybody. He said through Jesus Christ, we get eternal life. He is our Lord, not our job. Not our homes, not our kids, not our money. This is where we get our life. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 says, For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. It is so hard sometimes to tell people. You go into a funeral, and they ask you to do the funeral, and you ask them, Do you know if they ever had a relationship with Jesus Christ? They went to church all the time. That's not what I'm asking. I'm asking, did they ever talk to you at any point in time telling you that they made a decision to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ? Never heard it. But they're going to heaven, right? Why? Well, they were a good person. You know how hard it is to tell people when their loved one has has died that I'm sorry, but I cannot guarantee you that they're going to heaven? And as a matter of fact, if they've never shared with you that they ever had that relationship, they probably aren't. And they want to say, well, then don't do the funeral. Hey, I won't do the funeral. My job as a pastor, as a preacher, is not to pray people into heaven. 
My job as a pastor is not to console people in the family and tell them your loved one's going to heaven and lie to them. My job as a pastor is to be honest and truthful. And that is this, the only way that you can get to have life is through Jesus Christ. Nothing else. Amen. And may I also say, nothing less. It isn't Jesus and something, it's Jesus only. And that's what he says. He says, we all fall short of the standard of God. You and I, no matter how good we are, no matter how great we are, we could cure cancer. We could do anything that would be great and wonderful and get a name for ourselves and a legacy for ourselves. But that legacy still does not meet the standard that God has set for us to stand before him. The only standard is Jesus Christ. And when you and I get saved, guess who bears the standard? He imputes into us his righteousness, not mine. When God sees me, he doesn't see me, he sees Jesus. And when he sees Jesus, he says, you're cool. It's all right, I got you. I know who you are. As I was sharing in Sunday school, let me say this to you. It is not who you know, ladies and gentlemen. It is who knows you. If Jesus doesn't know you, you can know him all day. You could quote every scripture in the book, backwards and forwards, all the time, all you want. You can get up every morning and read your Bible 10 hours. Say your prayers and do everything else. But if Jesus doesn't know you, you're dead. You're dead. And none of that will get you there. Why? Because First Peter says, by his wounds, you are healed. You see, the doctor doesn't heal me. Jesus does. You know how I know Jesus loves me? Every time I picture the scars in his hands and in his feet, I know Jesus loves me. Why? Because he died so that I could live. John 3.16 says, this is how God loved the world, that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believeth in him will not perish, but have eternal life. And you see, he loved us so much that he gave us his son. And so many times we lose track of just how much Romans chapter 5 verse 8 says but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while what while we were sinners even before I knew Christ God sent his son so that I could live Luke chapter 23 and verse number 49 I need to take you back for just a moment. And I need to give you um, a front row seat to the crucifixion of Christ. You see, because if you were to be there that day that Christ was was dying, was being crucified. And if you were to look on the front row, you would see the women and his friends. Others had kind of scattered, but there were some that were still there. And in Luke chapter 23 and verse number 49, it said, but all who knew him, including the women, who followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching this experience. And they were there. But when you begin to look at these things, 
These were probably some of those disciples who had been following and traveled places with Jesus because there were more than just 12. There was actually 120. They had traveled with him from place to place, from time to time, and they come here. They watched him minister just like the others, and they had seen him do miracles just like the others. But when it talks about the women, it probably was mentioned maybe about Mary, his mother. Mary Magdalene, who was a prostitute that had gotten saved and began to follow Jesus. And you think for a moment, You're a mother that has walked with your son from the day he was born. And now he's being taken to a cross to be crucified and you're walking with him. You're experiencing his cries You, as a mother, are experiencing his pain while the father, not Joseph, but God, is also experiencing the pain of this moment. I've been in hospital rooms where the families have gathered around and watched as their loved one is slowly slipping away. I've been in rooms where they just, just peaceful and they just pass. I've never really been in a room where somebody has been in so much pain and so much agony as Jesus was experiencing that day. You see today, and even back then, they had the hysop, the vinegar, and the wine would kind of numb the pain. But if you remember, Jesus refused it. He didn't want the pain numbed. Think about it. Your sins and my sins, Jesus was feeling the pain. So let me say this to you. God knows your pain. And he knows what you're going through. And he has felt all of it in the worst moments. They didn't know how any of this was going to play out. They didn't know what was going to happen next. They just know that something was going to happen. Jesus, or Peter, the one that was the closest, he was a close friend of Jesus, feared for his life and ran wasn't around. But when you look at what happened later on in Luke chapter 23, in verse 53, there was a guy by the name of Joseph. And you got to understand something about this Joseph of Arimathea. You see, in order for Jesus to be put to death, the council had to give their approval. See, and Joseph of Arimathea, when you go back and look, you'll find that Joseph of Arimathea was on the council. Just a few minutes before few hours before 
Joseph of Arimathea was on the council saying, you can crucify him. Now after Jesus is dead, Joseph of Arimathea goes with another guy who also was a mighty leader in the Sanhedrin by the name of Nicodemus. You have two leaders of the council and the religious leaders. Nicodemus, we had seen about his encounter with Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea is now having his encounter. And so what does he do? He goes there and he says, Take, he had asked for the body, and this is talking about Joseph. Taking it down, he wrapped it in fine linen and placed it in a tomb cut out of the rock where no one had ever been placed. Joseph of Arimathea on the council that was crucifying Jesus gave the authority to do that, to put him on the cross had a sepulcher or a tombstone that nobody else had ever been laid in. And Joseph of Arimathea, with, along with Nicodemus, wrapped Jesus up and put him in the sepulcher. Even though he was on the council and doing these things, He was risking a great deal, just as, as Nicodemus when he came by night to see Jesus. He didn't want to be seen in the day because he knew that if he was saw, saw if he was seen, not saw, if he was seen in the daytime, that he could lose his authority. Joseph of Arimathea, at this point in time, he cared less about his authority now. It didn't matter if he was losing respect or anything else. He was risking everything that he had to take care of Jesus. You talk about doing something at a moment of crisis. Many of you have never gone through um, experiencing God. I don't know if, if any of you all, if anybody here has. Nobody's gone through experiencing... Okay, good. Somebody that will relate to me and, and witness what I'm saying is correct. In experiencing God, there is one thing that uh, Henry Blackaby talks about, and it's called a crisis of belief. That you're going to come to a moment in time where your belief all of a sudden, in order, in order to do this, you really are going to have to make a decision. Because when this happens, it's going to change everything. Not a, ma not a minor change, a major change. This was Joseph of Arimathea. This was going to change everything from him, from this day forward. No longer is he going to be able to hide anything whatsoever. But then if you go on into verses 55 and 56, you'll find that not only did Joseph and, and, and Nicodemus do this, but look at the women. The women who had come with him from Galilee followed along and observed the tomb and how his body was placed. Taking care of him, then they returned and prepared the spices and the perfumes, and they wrestled on the Sabbath according to the commandment. They couldn't do anything. The Sabbath has started. They couldn't give him a proper burial. So they went to the place where Jesus was being buried. They watched how they had prepared the body and wrapped him in everything else, making sure that everything was properly done. I don't know if, if you ever notice, I do this, and, and, and uh, how many, do you, in the funerals, have you done funerals? Okay, and you've done funerals, I know, right? Once everything is all done and the family is all dismissed, do you stand there with the casket? And do you stand there with the casket? 
or do you leave uh, after the family has left? John? Oh, you can't hear me? After you're done with the funeral, do you stand there with the casket? Yes. Okay. And, and, and have you done a funeral yet? And, and do you stay with the casket? I generally don't know. Okay. I do. You do? Yes. You want to know why? I make sure that that body is taken care of. Yeah. Make sure that they don't do anything to that body while that family is leaving. If they take off rings, if they take off any, any kind of apparel or, or, or glasses or whatever, I make sure that that goes to whoever it goes, supposed to go to. I stay there until they actually uh, put the casket down and, and, and uh, do the tightening, uh, tightening it up. Why? It is just something that was done from the very beginning with Jesus. We do these things and sometimes we don't even realize why we did it until we come to a point we realize that's why we do it. We just watch to make sure that the body is taken and prepared the right way. Because many times those families are not there. They, they've left and they can't handle that shutting uh, of that coffin on their loved ones. And so it's, we make sure that they're taken care of and everything is okay with that body. And this is what they did. They wanted to make sure their Lord and their Savior was taken care of there. And then the Bible tells them that, that all of a sudden, you know, they waited till the Sabbath. And as soon as the Sabbath was over and it was early light, sun up, Sabbath done, we're going back to Jesus. And they went back there, going, you know. They got their spices, everything that they had already. They, I, and you know, I don't know how much they slept. Waiting for that moment. And all of a sudden, they're going back to Jesus. They're anointing him. And they're going to do this. And it said they, they, they came there. And then in Luke chapter 24, in, in verses 5 and 8, they, they arrived at the tomb. And they were terrified because of something that had happened. Because they had seen that the grave had been sealed. The tomb. Had, they had put a rock there. But they forgot, how are you going to get this rock moved? But look what it says. It says, so the women who were terrified and they bowed down to the ground because they seen these two men. The, the, rock is, the, the, the rock is rolled away. The tomb is empty or it's open. And they see these two guys there. And they say, so the women were terrified and they bowed down to the ground. And they say, why? And the two men looked and asked them. They, they say, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Asked the men. You're coming to a place where someone's dead, but don't you understand, the one that you're looking for that is dead, he's not here. He's not here, but he has been resurrected. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee? He told you what he was going to do. Verse 7 and 8, Linda, if you would. Saying, the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and rise on the third day. And then they remembered his words. Isn't it amazing sometimes how we've got to have somebody repeat the words to us in order for us to remember them? How easy it is for us to forget what somebody told us? Then all of a sudden, they remind us. I have that problem, and my wife reminds me all the time. If I'm telling a story and I forget how it goes, I'll say, you were there, help me. Her memory's a lot better than mine. But let me talk to, about this and let's finish. Number one, at the resurrection, ladies and gentlemen, they, or the death of this, they were more than just spectators. They didn't just sit there and watch. You see, it said that they were his friends. And you, you need to understand something. A lot of times we have become spectators. We, we believe that Christianity is a spectator sport. Why should I get involved? Y you know, honestly, why should I get involved in church? What's the sense in it? 
if I get involved in church, there's all these problems that everybody has. And, and if I don't get involved in church, then I don't get involved in anybody's problems. And hey, it's cool because uh, if Terry gets saved today and goes forward, hey man, I got to experience a great blessing. He's already saved, okay. Right? Yeah, okay, we got you. So, so hey, I don't need to get involved to, to really get the blessings of somebody getting saved. All I had to do was just show up. Whoa, Lord, you bless me. That is awesome. But you know what? You got involved in Sparky's this year, right? Yes. Okay. What did you learn out of there? I'll put you on the spot. You did. <laughs> How much did it bless you to watch those little kids? Oh, it was great. They we got more out of them than the kids did. I think I said that earlier. Could you have done that staying home? No. I rest my case, guys and gals. You can stay home and not get involved all you want to, and you miss out on everything. As long as we continue to treat Christianity as a spectator sport, we don't get all of the blessings that God has got in store for us. It's like playing baseball. I love watching the Cincinnati Reds. Sometimes. But let me say this to you. Spectators know about Jesus. Followers know Jesus. Spectators stick around until the going gets rough. Followers stick it out to the end. You see, with the Cincinnati Reds, there's a lot of people that are their spectators. And as soon as their team started going south, they, they quit following them. I am a follower. Whether they win or lose, I'm following them. I can be watching a game and they can lose 20 to one and I'll still be watching it. Saying, I can't believe that coach. Why do you leave that pitcher in so long? But I'm a follower. I'll stick it to the end. Spectators live by their feelings and their emotions. Followers live by what they know. You can be a spectator, and when they score a touchdown, or they hit a home run, or they do whatever, and you're great and wonderful, but as soon as somebody else scores, and they're leading, I'm done with this game. And that's the way a lot of people are with Christianity. To them, it is a spectator sport. As soon as things go south in my life, I'm done. I'm done with God. How could God let my child die? How could God let my spouse die? How could God let my job go south? How could God do this and how could God do that? And God's saying, I'm still here. As long as we continue to play this spectator sport, ladies and gentlemen, we can't be blessed. And you won't see a breakthrough that God wants to have in your life. Followers of Jesus spend a lifetime building a relationship with Jesus where spectators are focused on living for themselves. What can the church get out of me. They, they are so blessed that I am here. If it wasn't for me, y'all wouldn't have no blessings. Really? There ain't no way. If I wasn't here, God would send somebody else and y'all still would have blessings. 
Might have more. I don't know. Followers of Jesus are willing to follow Jesus wherever he goes. Spectators follow Jesus only when it's easy. And they don't last long. Luke chapter 23 says, when the captain saw what had happened, he honored God. This man was innocent, a good man and innocent. All who come around as spectators to watch the show, when they saw what had actually happened, were overcome with grief and headed home. Those who knew Jesus well, along with the women who, who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a respectable distance and they kept vigil. Number two is they rested. What did they do? They rested on the Sabbath. They didn't try to fix anything. Too many times what happens is when things go wrong in our life, we try to fix it. Let me say this to y'all. You can't fix it. You understand? You are, I, it isn't like the, the uh, 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 a mayor of Carter country. And some of you are old enough to remember that show, right? When Carter was president in 1972 to 76, and they came up with a show called Carter Country, and there was the mayor in there, a little, little guy like this, and he, all he would say was, handle it, handle it, handle it, handle it. Problem come up, handle it, handle it, handle it. And, and sometimes what we need to understand is we can't handle it. We can't handle it. We need to understand that the only one that can handle it is the one that really needs to be in charge in the first place, and that is God, not us. Jesus rested in the middle of the storm of the Sea of Galilee. In the movie, Joyce, she rested after her son was given hope. Until then, no, I'm sticking it out. Now he's got hope. So what we need to understand is even in the middle of the storm of life, when Jesus' mother Mary saw that Jesus had died, she went home and rested on the Sabbath. Really, she did. Scripture said so. They went home and they rested and got ready. Resting means this, ladies and gentlemen. It doesn't mean going to sleep, okay? It means to understand that everything God has control. God has control. You need to turn loose of the wheel. Get out of the driver's seat and get over into the student driver's seat. And if you want a wheel, there's a wheel there and you can turn it wherever you want to, but understand you ain't controlling nothing. <laughs> it's like, it, it's like the, the new uh, cars that they brought back at Kings Island that our kids always loved. When we, when we took our, our boys there when they were young, we would let them sit in the front and we would sit in the back and they just thought, man, this is awesome, this is great. Look at us, mom, look at us, dad. We're driving, we're driving, we're driving. Never once did we ever tell them, no, you're just following the, the little metal bar in the middle. No. We need to understand, ladies and gentlemen, turn loose of the wheel. The, the second thing was they rested in the last point in my last half an hour that I'll give you this. <laughs> is you need to remember God's promises. When the ladies arrived early that Sunday morning and they looked and they were going to take care of the body of Jesus, his body was gone, and, and they were puzzled about this. And then it said, and then they remembered his words. I 
Then they remembered his words. When you're facing the situations in your life, when it seems like everything has come to a halt, remember his words. I will be with you always, even until the end of the world. No matter what you're going through, no matter what's happening, God says, if you are my child, I'm not leaving you. I don't care what anybody else tells you. He's not leaving. You can say, God, I want you out of here. And he says, I ain't leaving. This ain't your house, it's my house. <laughs> I'm staying. He made these promises. They went back and they remembered. He promised them what? That he would, that he would rise again. So here's what I need you to remember these things. The most important miracle that you can ever do in your life is give your life completely to Jesus. Not part of it, all of it. All of it. That's a miracle. Because we want to hold pieces. I want to control this part, Jesus. You've got the other 99. <laughs> Let me have my little piece over here. You, you know, that I just want to hang on to. But if you need a, a breakthrough, here's your prayer. Remember what she said? Holy Spirit, breathe life back into my son, John, or John. Maybe if in your home you need to pray, Holy Spirit, pray life back into my home. Maybe you need to say, Holy Spirit, breathe life back into my relationships, my dreams, my finances, my family, my church, my life. And in the name of Jesus, amen and amen. What are you looking for today? Where do you need that breakthrough? Someplace, somewhere in your life you need it. And maybe what you need to do right now is to say the same thing that this mother did. Holy Spirit, bring life back into whatever you fill in the blank. Because as long as you are the one that's trying to fill in the blank and bring life to it, it ain't happening. It may happen for a little while, but let me tell you something. After a little while, it's gone. You want to know why? You and I have unlimited strength. It's like, um, y'all like going fishing. You ever catch a whopper? Not told about a whopper, but catch a whopper. But that thing just grabs that line and it just takes off. And the harder that you reel, it seems like the stronger that fish gets. And you're doing the best you can not to break that line, right? And after a while, you get tired. And you just want to turn loose of that fish. No, you don't want to turn loose? Now I get some help. You know, now you get some help. <laughs> there you go. So in your life, when you're fighting these problems and you're reeling all you can and you think, okay, I'm tired. Now I need help. Now ask Jesus for help. May I say this wrong? No. As soon as it hits the line, Jesus, help me turn the reel. <laughs> Help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. I can't do this by myself. I need your help. I need your help. 
because Jesus by myself, I'm lost. I'm lost. My question to you this morning is, are you ready to let God breathe life back into whatever situation that you need him breathe? Breathe life back into Holy Spirit. Breathe it this morning. Let's stand. Hello, this is Pastor Chuck Cotton from Calvary Baptist Church. First of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for taking the time out to either listen to our sermon or to watch it on video. We are grateful that you've actually taken the time and hope and pray that it has been a blessing to you as it was to us as we delivered it to our congregation. We ask if you have any questions whatsoever that you email us at Pastor Chuck at CalvaryBaptistMiddletown.org or you could come in and give us a phone call, if you would please, at area code 513-423-7251. I'd like to take this opportunity to also invite you to come to our church and visit us, if you would please. We actually have small groups on Sunday morning starting at 9.30 with our morning worship. Prior to our morning um, small groups, we also provide donuts with coffee, um, milk, orange juice, a time for fellowship, get to know each other, have a good time before we actually break out into our small groups for Sunday. Our worship services are uplifting, they're fast moving, and everything in our service is just a fast pace. But we do take time every once in a while to slow down as we feel the Holy Spirit moving, and we never want to hinder it in any way. We also have on Sunday evening, and during the school year, we have Awana, and Awana starts with the Puggles, actually from age two all the way up through high school. And during that period of time, we also have a worship service. Both of these start at six o'clock and end at 7.30. Our Wednesday night, we have a Bible study, which starts at seven. We generally finish about 8.15. We would love for you to come and visit with us. Don't have to dress up, just come as you are, because to us, it doesn't matter. You're, you're a child of God, a creation of His, and so to us, you're important to everything that we do. Our motto here is building the kingdom one life at a time. And we hope that we have a chance to visit with you, get to know you as you get to know us. So thank you and may God bless you.